Hi, I'm Rick Thorpe. I'm the Bishop of Islington in London, and I'm a friend and a big fan of your rector, Christine. She is very gifted, very godly, and very gracious. So look after her, pray for her, and encourage her. My role in the Church of England is to start or plant new Anglican churches and revitalise old churches in London and around England. New churches are really good at connecting with new people and younger people, so we need them to help with the mission of the whole church. And they need us to encourage them and support them and pray for them in their vital work. We need each other. Today, I want to focus on the reading from Mark's Gospel and to talk about how to achieve greatness. In the Second World War here in England, we needed to increase our production of coal. The Prime Minister of Great Britain, Winston Churchill, called together the Labour leaders to enlist their support. At the end of his presentation, he asked them to picture in their minds a parade which he knew would be held in central London, perhaps around Piccadilly Circus, after the war. First, he said, would come the sailors who had kept the vital sea lanes open. Then would come the soldiers who had come home from Dunkirk and then gone on to defeat Rommel in Africa. Then would come the pilots who had driven the Luftwaffe from the skies. And last of all, he said, would come a long line of sweat-stained, soot-streaked men in miners' caps. Someone from the crowd um, would call out, where were you during the critical days of our struggle? And from 10,000 throats would come the answer, we were deep in the earth with our faces to the coal. You know, I long to make a difference in this world. If it was possible, I would love to have people say that what I achieved was great. But this almost certainly will involve sacrifice and acts of service that few will see. It will mean putting my face to the coal, getting my hands dirty, blood, sweat and tears that flow freely. Perhaps it may never reach public awareness, but it will still make a difference. I also know the deep satisfaction that comes from someone you value deeply when they say, well done, you made a difference. That person's life is different because of you. So whether it's well known or hidden, how can we achieve greatness? Well, Jesus said, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. So to achieve greatness, we start, first of all, by confronting the oldest sin. James and John knew that Jesus had access to high places. They wanted to secure their place in the world and the next. Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand, in your glory. And they go on to say that they will face anything that might come their way in terms of challenge, of opposition or sacrifice. But they don't really know what they're asking or what they're saying. And Jesus, in a very kind way, says to them, don't get too big for your boots and don't try and manipulate things for your own ends. You know, the disciples are less subtle. Verse 41 says, they began to be very angry. Other translations say, they were indignant. I actually wonder whether they were jealous. Perhaps they wished they'd asked first. Anyhow, Jesus calls them together and says to them, don't lord it over people. Don't be proud. Instead, verses 43 and verses 44, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. And if Jesus is confronting the oldest sin in the book, pride. How do we recognise pride in ourselves? Well, essentially, pride is a life revolving around me. Do you remember the heavyweight world champion boxer, Muhammad Ali? He used to say, I am the greatest. What about ourselves? Well, it might be vanity. That's being preoccupied by my appearance or image. 
or stubbornness. You know, stubbornness is the pride that causes us to shun correction. It makes us unable to stop defending ourselves. When someone points out an error or flaw, we evade or deny or blame someone else. It's when we're always right and we won't give in. Or exclusion. At the deepest level, pride is the choice to exclude both God and other people from their rightful place in our hearts. Jesus said the essence of the spiritual life is to love God and to love people. And pride destroys our capacity to love. Pride moves us to exclude rather than to embrace, to bow down before a mirror rather than before God, to judge rather than to serve. And as Jesus pointed out to the gathered disciples, pride does not make you great. So in place of pride, Jesus invites us secondly to a life of humility. This journey, and it is a journey, starts with facing the reality about ourselves. We are not the centre of the universe. My physics teacher taught me about Copernicus, or what he used to call copper knickers, to help us to remember. In the 16th century, people thought that the sun revolved around the earth and that the earth was the centre of the universe. Well, Copernicus proposed and developed early proofs that actually the earth revolved around the sun. And he popped a huge bubble of human pride by revealing the truth about our world and us. We're not the middle, we're not the centre. There was so much resistance to him and it mostly came from the church. We must not live as if everyone revolves around us. Humility is not about convincing ourselves or others that we are unattractive or incompetent. It's not about beating ourselves up and trying to make ourselves nothing. If God wanted to make us nothing, he could have done it. No, humility is found by serving others. Look at the example of Jesus. He was the king of kings, and yet he washed the disciples' feet. We read these words in Philippians chapter 2. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. When Jesus came in the form of a servant, he was not disguising who God is. He was revealing who God is. God is the infinite servant. God is the most humble being in the universe. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. So thirdly, how do we pursue a life of servanthood? Well, years ago, the Salvation Army was holding an international convention and their founder, General William Booth, could not attend because he was too weak to travel. So he cabled his convention message to them. It was one word. Others. Pursuing a life of servanthood means allowing others to come into our lives. So here are four little ways of what that might look like. First of all, being helpful. Look for the little ways, the hidden ways of helping those around us without drawing attention to ourselves. You know, this can get a lot of fun. How many times can you do it without them noticing? Secondly, being available. Make room for interruptions, for tasks that are not on our agenda. We must not be so in control of our time that we're unavailable to talk or help or pray with troubled people. People who we might not be able to cure or who can't contribute towards our success. The authentic community we cherish is characterised perhaps more than anything else by mutual servanthood, mutual submission. When Jesus said these words about becoming great by being a servant or a slave, he wasn't giving orders. He was simply describing the truth about God's kind of community and how different it looks from the way things generally work in the world. That is the kind of servanthood Jesus calls us to, a society of sinners helping one another. Thirdly, being honest, acknowledging our weaknesses. 
Remember Muhammad Ali, the greatest? He once refused to fasten his seatbelt on a plane. And after repeated requests from the flight attendant to buckle up, Ali finally said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. Seat belt. To which the flight attendant said, Superman don't need no airplane. It's difficult for some of us to admit that we are not Superman or Wonder Woman. I must admit my sinful pride and embrace my limitations and human weakness. And fourthly, being there. We're called to bear with each other's burdens, sometimes praying for another's needs or trying to comfort someone in pain. Sometimes it feels as if an entire relationship is burdensome. I may need to bear with people until I learn to love them. It's more than simply tolerating difficult people. It's also learning to hear God speak through them. It's learning to be for them. It's learning that the most difficult person I have most to deal with is me. So where does all this leave us? Well, it turns out that the most attractive kind of life, when our desires are true and pure, is a life of humility. And we see this most clearly in Jesus himself. There was no grandiosity in Jesus at all. He was no Superman. He did not defy his enemies with hands on his hips and bullets bouncing harmlessly off his chest. The whip of the Roman soldiers drew real blood. The thorns pressed real flesh. The nails caused mind-numbing pain. The cross led to actual death. And through it all, he bore with them, forgave them, loved them to the end. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus said, the way to achieve greatness is to become a servant. So confront pride, journey towards humility, pursue servanthood. Amen.